So now it's time to get on with some editing. I generally bring stuff in through the media tab. You don't have to. So you can just drag things in from Explorer, but I like to bring in stuff through the media tab where possible. The clips I'll be using for this are some clips that I've used a lot in my tutorials. I'm using them because, A, if you've seen any of my other tutorials, you'll know how I use these in another program, so it directly compares to this one. Plus, they show off all sorts of problems and stupid things that went wrong, things like the, the angle on here is not correct, and so it's a good thing to actually use to put stuff together. These clips are AVC HD. If you look at the folder where they're stored, actually there's a folder called AVCHD, another subfolder, and another subfolder, and eventually you get to the clips, which are these things. And you might notice that I just clicked on the interview folder and it showed me the clips straight away, equivalent to you know, what EDIUS' source browser would do or Premiere's media browser. It cuts through all the stuff and just shows you the clips. This is something Resolve didn't used to do, but it does now. Hasn't worked for me on every type of clip. Some different formats don't show up that way and you have to kind of drill down through the card and find the actual clips, but it is working for me now with AVCHD. These clips aren't on a card. I've already copied them onto the computer. Now, suppose they were on a card, it would still show up in here and you'd want to take all that lot and copy them onto your computer. Now, you can just go into Windows and do it, which is what I tend to do most of the time. In fact, once I film something, I'll back it up straight away, but I won't start editing straight away. So I'll generally always have a copy on a computer. But suppose you haven't, there is a clone tool inside of Resolve you can use to copy the stuff for you. So if you click on the clone tool and say add job, it says, right, where are you going from and where are you going to? And like it says, just drag a source folder here and a destination folder here. So I'm going to drag the interview folder and dump it there. And then I'm going to decide where to stick it. I've only got the one hard drive in here, so I'm going to have to choose somewhere else. So I'm going to right click on the D drive and say create new folder and say call it copied and then drag that over there. Now imagine that was on a card. This is on my hard drive. Click clone. Off it goes and does it. And in a minute, what will happen is I'll have all those clips there cloned into a new location. If I go to the copied folder, you can see that yeah, I've got all those clips. If I want to actually go to where that is on the hard drive, obviously I could just pull up Windows Explorer, but I can right click on it and say open file location. You can see what actually happened there. Everything inside the interview folder was copied across. So that's a very simple way to copy stuff off a card so you can then start using it using the clone tool. Most of the time, I have to admit, I don't simply because I've already copied the stuff onto a hard drive. You can also delete stuff inside of here. Suppose I didn't want this stuff. I can right click on it and say delete folder permanently and it goes ahead and will delete all that stuff off of the hard drive. My original stuff still there, but the clone stuff wasn't. Now, some programs only let you delete stuff which is in the project folder. Resolve will let you delete stuff that's anywhere on the computer. Obviously, you can get in a mess doing that, but it is possible to do it. I want to take these clips, and one of my favorite ways of bringing in a folder is to right-click on the folder and say, add the folder and subfolders into the media pool and create bins. I like to use this one because it'll bring the stuff in and it'll make a bin for it. My project's currently 25 and I want to change it to 50 to match the clips. That's now brought all that stuff in there and it's created for me a little folder called interview. So I can select a couple, like I want to select the keying and the still ones which I haven't brought in. Right click and say bring it in and create bins. And Bosch it brings it in and creates bins for all of them. So this down here is the project window. This is your hard drive, this is your computer. And this is the project window. So this is what's actually in the project. And you can pop off to the edit tab and come back to this and add more stuff in. You don't have to do everything at the start. You can also just drag up Windows Explorer and say I wanted to bring that clip in. I could just drag it and pop it in there and it comes in. Or I could take that still stuff and bring it in and that comes in and it's named with the name of the folder. Or let's suppose I didn't have any of that stuff. I could actually just go to the footage folder, grab that, drag it, bring it in and it creates a folder called footage with all my stuff in it already. Some of the folders don't have anything because what it does is it looks through all those folders and only brings in things which are useful clips. So it hasn't brought in anything in the backup folder. The backup folder had my project backup in it. If you look at some of these other things, there's not just a file in there. There's other stuff that other programs have created. It's just trimmed it down to show you the useful stuff. You also notice you've got this option for favorites. I use this a lot. So suppose I do keep all of my footage in a footage folder. I can right click on it and say add to favorites and then it's there. So wherever I am in the computer, I just click on that and it takes me to the footage folder. 
Lots of nice little stuff like that to help you getting around. The rest of it you got in here, I had the clone tool open, but I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to close that down. But I've got a player window where I can drag through stuff and play it. This is showing me the audio meters, or I could have it showing me the audio waveform. This is showing me other information about the clip. So it's just a way of sort of organizing your media. You also have these things called smart bins. Again, you don't really need to know what they are to start off with. I did tick a little box in the settings under the preferences. So if I go back to these preferences up here and the user settings, I did tick smart bin for timelines. That's what this is being shown down here. What this does is automatically make up a bin which will have all the timelines in. So they'll be in here somewhere, but they'll also be all of them down there. So, you know, I could have one in interview, one in keying, one in footage. This would show me the lot. And you can see the other kind of automatic smart bins you can make up. So if you put in keywords, anything with a particular keyword will pop up in a bin. I don't actually want that one because I haven't got any keyboards. Smart bins for people. So one of the things it can do is go through and analyze your clips, recognize people's faces, and then make a smart bin for everything that's got me in it or everything that's got Ringo in it, all this kind of stuff. I put one in there for the timelines because I like to have that if I've got a project with lots of timelines in. Now you want to start editing. You could go to the cut page and edit it from here. So you know, I pop into the interview folder and I start dragging clips down and editing. And you can edit quite fast with that. There's a limit to what you can do because the idea is you get to do it nice and quickly. But I'm not gonna go through that. I'm gonna go straight to the edit page because that's a lot more like other editing programs. Might do something on the cut page on another time. Right now, I just wanna get you started and going really. So here I've got a project window. I've got a player window. Thing called the inspector, which is a bit like the effects control window in Premiere, kind of like the information window in Edius, except you can do more stuff with it. I'm going to turn that off because I don't need that at the moment, which is just going to leave me a source and a destination. And down here, I've got a timeline. And there's loads and loads of things you can click on here. Obviously, at the moment, the media pool is showing, which is the project window. This is showing me all the bins. This is what's in a particular bin. If I click that, it just shows me one particular bin. The others are still there. You just can't see it. And you've got lots of things like you obviously can change the size of them. You can change the way they're displayed between icons and lists, and different types of icons. And there's a search function, lots of different stuff in here. And you can change the sort order just by clicking on this thing and saying what you're going to sort it by. Those are all fairly straightforward. And if you click on here, there's more stuff. I could spend hours and hours just talking about that, but I really want to get to the editing. One thing I'll point out is this, this little icon here, if it's orange, then it's saying that some of the clips in your project, so some of these things actually aren't there anymore. Somebody's gone ahead and deleted them or something's gone wrong with them. If you click on that, it will bring up a list of all the things that are missing and let you search for them. So if you ever see that orange, it means that something in here is missing. It might not be something that's used on the timeline, it could be something you could ignore, but that's if you see that's orange, that's what that does. I can also display a list of different types of effects, just like the kind of stuff you'd see in every other editing program. There's an edit index, which just gives you a list of what's on the timeline. And this is where you'd also see markers if you made any. Probably won't get onto that. And a sound library. Sound library is a bunch of free sound effects that Resolve gives you. And I haven't installed them yet. So here I would click on download, open up an internet thingy bob and let it download it. So fill in your details. It's forever asking me to fill in details when I am downloading the free versions of Resolve or this kind of thing and they've never ever pestered me with anything. But now that thing's going to download for me and I can install it later on. Again, we don't need that for the purposes of this tutorial. It's worth getting because there's kind of nice lot of sound effects in there, but that's where the sound library would turn up if you want to see it. And like I mentioned before, you can make that bin bigger or smaller. What I want to do is take some clips, bung them on the timeline, put together a little edit and then export it. Now this particular scene, you may have seen before if you've had any of my tutorials, but basically, what happens is that it's a conversation between the two of us. This is me. This is a guy called Ringo, who's one of my head technical honchos. It is quite old, but it is a good example of doing a simple one camera shoot. So we did a wide shot with the both of us. Ringo comes in, sits down, we say a couple of things and that's it. And then we did close ups on me and close ups on him. And I did a couple of shots which are completely wrong just to give an idea of really bad compositions. Primarily, I'm gonna do the opening shot and then him, me, him, me, job done. To use any of this, just double click on it, put it in the layer here, and then you can look through it. Just like everything else, spacebar to play and stop, arrow key backwards to move things. So that's going one frame forward, one frame backwards, shift and arrow to go through at higher speed, or you can use the buttons that are down here. 
There's a jog wheel here, so you can use that. Just stick the mouse over the little dot and then move it backwards and forwards. And there's J, K, and L. So L moves at one speed. L again moves at two speed, four speed. You can get the numbers down here and so on. K stops it, J goes backwards. That's all very familiar to every other editing program. So what I want to do is I want to get to the start of this clip and then mark that as the in point. And the start is going to be just about here, just before Ringo comes on. So I just want to go to just when his hand is coming in, about there, and I want to mark that as the starting point. Now I generally use keyboard shortcuts to mark the ins and outs, I for in, O for out, but you do have these buttons. That's mark in and that's mark out. Hang over them long enough and they'll tell you that. And all this other stuff here is fairly self-explanatory. This little thing gives you options to show other stuff. You could just try and show the audio if you wanted to. What's nice in Resolve actually is you can just show the picture and the sound together. So if I come up to these little dots, if you remember these little dots give you other options. And I could say, oh, show me a zoomed audio waveform. Or show me the whole audio waveform. So that's showing me the waveform for the entire clip. And I can use that to kind of judge when things are happening or look at words or I could zoom right into it. So I'm showing just what's around these couple of frames. I quite like to have that one up showing me the whole thing. But yep, there we are. I've now got the in point on that clip. I want this to run until Ringo sits down. So I'm going to press the play button. Hi. 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 And I'm going to mark that as the out point. So I for out. So you can see I've got a bit marked in there and I want to put it onto the timeline. And again, just like all other editing programs, you can just grab it and drop it. And it goes on the timeline. And I want it right at the start. And yep, there we are. That pretty much like every other editing program. You do have a nice option that you can drag it from here and drop it over this window. And you can choose what you want to do. Like if I want to insert something, I can just drag it over here and insert. And that will go on the timeline exactly wherever the playhead was. Or if I say overwrite, that'll wipe out what's on the timeline from the playhead onwards. Or suppose I go to here, let's take, yeah, take another shot, make it more obvious. And I drop that down and I say replace. Well, that replaces that clip with this clip. Place on top, we'll add it and put it onto another track above it. Pen to end drops it at the end. I'll be using that a bit more as I go through. Of course, I made a right mess here, so I'm going to undo it. Undo is control Z. So you can control Z a few times, or you can come up to edit history, and there you can see you've got a history window, so I could jump back quite away. So let's go to say there, a bit further along. Yep, you can, as it says here, open up a history window, and then you can jump back there if you want to. That's where I want to get to. I want to get where I've just dropped that onto the timeline. Or control Z to undo, control shift Z to redo. All the usual kind of keyboard shortcuts. So I do use keyboard shortcuts a lot. Most of them in here, most of the basic ones in here are exactly the same. Now the timeline, just like all other editing program, is composed of video tracks and audio tracks. A nice thing about the timeline in Resolve is it's only got one video track. If I just drag a clip up there, it will create a new video track for me. And drag it there, another new video track. Let's just dump that lot and get back to where I was. You have got a video clip and some audio clips. Why has this thing split it up into six different tracks? So for example, if I take that and put it on the timeline, it's only one track. Why has it done that? That's because this clip happened to be surround sound and I didn't have any surround sound tracks. I could add one in. So if I come over to the track header here, right click and add tracks, I could put in 5.1 surround sound track. And you think, well, then I could drag that in and that would go on the surround sound track, but it doesn't. It doesn't because although this clip is surround sound, Resolve is not treating it like a surround sound clip. If I go back to the clip in the bin, right click on it and go to clip attributes, clip properties and other programs, stuff for the video, stuff for the audio, time code and the name of the clip. Under the audio, it's decided that my surround sound clip has actually got six mono tracks. So that's why it dumped it down there rather than putting it on a surround track. Now I could change that. Now, so far that hasn't done anything. I've just literally told it it's a round sound. But now I go to these tracks down here. Now don't worry too much if you don't follow this. It's a bit more advanced than a basic tutorial, but I'm just gonna mention it here anyway. What I could have done is made the formats 5.1, told it to have only one track of 5.1 and got rid of all the others. 
So I don't need these monos. Let's dump that, dump that, dump, 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 and dump. And now I've got that as a one single surround sound clip. So if I was to drag that and put it onto the timeline now, it goes in and all the audio there is merged into one. How it comes out at the other end also will depend on lots of settings over here, which I'm going to come on to later on. Now I'm going to ignore that for now. I'm just going to have it come in and drop down there like that, because I'll sort that out later on. That's why this has ended up with six different tracks and this doesn't. So there, I've done my first clip. Ringo comes in and sits down. Now he says something, which is this close up. You might, by the way, notice that as I hover over any of these clips, not only is it dragging through here in the little thumbnail, but it's popping up here as well in the player. So if I do that, yeah, that's showing me in the player as well as in the little thumbnail. But as soon as I let go, as soon as I take the mouse off, it goes back to whatever the clip was in there in the first place, which is this Ringo clip. Why is it doing that? It's doing that because of a little thing called Live Preview. Again, click on these little dots, turn off Live Media Preview, and now I can drag through in the little thumbnails, but it doesn't change what's up there. Most of the time you'll probably want to have that on, but that's not something that most programs do, so that might get quite confusing for you. Why does it show me something and then jump back to something else all of a sudden? Anyway, I'm going to take this clip and I'm going to find out where he starts talking, which in this case is about there. Nice helpful little waveform they're showing me. And I'm going to mark that as the endpoint. Then he says, David, I want to ask you about blah, 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 blah. How easy is it to edit? Mark that as the out point. I use I and O. I hardly ever use these buttons, but I do use I and O. Now I want to put that after this clip. Now at the moment, the playhead is quite happily there, so I could just drag it and drop it. Let me undo that. Yeah, when you're dragging and dropping, it really doesn't matter where the playhead is. That this matters when you use buttons or keyboard shortcuts to put things on the timeline. Now, in this case, I'd probably use my little draggy over here to do it. So if I drag that over and said insert, it's going to chop that one in two because the playhead was in the middle of the one. Don't want to do that. If I dragged it over and says overwrite, it's going to wipe out that. Don't want to do that. In this case, actually, it might be nice to drag it over here and say append at end. Because it just puts it after the other clip. Nice and simple. You do have buttons here for doing the same thing. So this one will insert a clip. This one will overwrite it and this one will replace it. And because I'm used to editing that way, I do use these a lot, but I really like that to drop down here. Premiere's got a very similar kind of drop down. Other programs don't. Anyway, let me go back to where I was. I've now got two clips. To play them, you stick the playhead somewhere, press the play button, and watch David, it. Oh, David, I wanted to ask you about ABCH. And yep, that's not right. I've actually got to do something to sort that out. In fact, there's already things I need to sort out here. Like this is a stereo clip where the sound is all over one side because this was filmed on the directional microphone, so that all the sound was over one side of the microphone, not the other. This is a surround sound clip, so what am I going to do with that lot? These things are all things I'll have to come back to. You might also say, if you know this footage from my previous tutorials, if you look at the levels here, so you can see this little level display here, if you want to see it bigger, you can just come up to Mixer and click Mixer, and you'll get a bigger display up there. But if you look at that, I mean, you'll only know it's on one side because I told you, but it's over both sides. Why is that? Yep, come back to all that later on. Mainly, I want to put the edit together, do a little bit of trimming, and do the sound afterwards. Now, after Ringo says something, I make a reply. So I am going to select me. There's my reply, starts about there. Well, it's pretty easy to edit the stuff these days. As long as you've got an up-to-date computer and the right editing program, you just put it into the program and edit it. And I wobble on a bit, and maybe I want to chop out a bit in the middle because I talk too much, but yep, I must end, I'm guessing, about there. And I'm going to take that, and again, I could just drag it and drop it, or I could come over here and say append to end. How easy is it to edit? Well, it's pretty easy to edit. Okay, now I go back to Ringo, then I go back to me. That's tedious. Let's do all the Ringos at once, and then put me in afterwards, because that'll be quicker. Now, Ringo is this clip, 44 MTS. I could go back to the bin, double click on it and put it up there, or I could come to this little drop down, which is above the source player, and choose 44. Might have helped if I'd named that Ringo, actually. Just click on it and say Ringo. I'm so Look through that, blah, 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 blah. Oh, hang on. Looking at this here, there's a little noddy. Oh, I might want to use that later. And I'm going to press M to put a marker on it, just so I know roughly where there's something interesting. That's not what I want right now, but I might want that later on. Anyway, let's troll along and look for his reply. Oh, it's there. Right, so in. 
And Sony and Panasonic cameras, is there a big difference between the footage? Ah, that's where he finishes. Out. I love having the waveform display up there. It makes life a lot easier. And again, drag that, drop it, append at the end. Look through this a bit more. In. Out. Append at end. And finally. Oh, that ends there. In. Out. Append at end. Got all my ringos in. Let's go back to me. You can see me. Oh, I start talking about there. In out and i need to pop it in between these two now i could just put the cursor there and press this button and it puts it in there or i could put the cursor there grab hold of this drag it and put an insert and it'll put it in between the two both of those do exactly the same thing when you're using the cursor and dropping stuff in it's also important what things are lit up over here so it went on v1 because that was lit up and that was lit up now I've got more than one video track, so if I were to drag that and pop it up there, you notice my little orange line goes there and it says V1 again. This is telling me, look, video one from here is going there. And so if I was to press the button or drag it, you know, the video goes up there. Same with the audio. If I move the audio down there, and the audio's gone there and the video's gone there. Let's undo those two. So those things are important. This is the track patching part of Resolve. Also, these things are important, which is the auto track selector. I would leave those on all the time. They're a bit like sync locks in other programs. So suppose I had stuff all over the place and say, suppose that was off and I put the audio down there. See what's happened is I've turned that off. I've inserted a clip. So let's move the video down, put the audio down there, but haven't moved this audio because that auto track selector is off. Now, when you're starting, I would definitely recommend leaving those on, which is the default pretty much all the time and never fiddling with them. Anyway, let's get back to putting me in. So I've got that. I need to get back to this one. Where's my reply? Up there. Bosch, insert. Oh, the audio's gone in the wrong place because I hadn't moved that back. So I could undo it or I could just pick up the audio and move it up there. And let's go to the end here. By the way, I'm snapping to these joins because snapping is enabled. It's a good idea to enable snapping simply because it makes sure that you don't leave any accidental frame gaps between things. Pop along to the end with my very insincere. You're welcome. Append at end. And there we are. I've got a little edit put together of me talking to Ringo. Problems all over the shop. Things aren't straight. The joins between edits are bad. Really, really bad. Sound needs a bit of work, especially at the start here. What on earth do I do all the surround sound things? But there we are. That's it, I've now put together an edit, which is pretty similar to most other editing programs. Pretty easy to follow.